We're back on The Big Show. It's Alex Belfield with a comedy Christmas, talking to my heroes and my favourite people, and I've definitely got one of those for you now. Jeannie Yashere, how are you? I'm very good. Very good. I, I'm, I'm your hero, Alex. I'm very impressed by that. I'll tell you why you are, because you're a female and you're funny. There aren't many of those, are there? That's true, that's true. Uh, that We are very few and far between, I must say. But the interesting thing is, you are international and you really made your name more in America than you did here. I mean, you were working the circuit, but that's kind of hard work. You went to do American TV and became a huge star and now are you 50 50 over there or even more what you know what i'm not a huge star yet i'm still starting again in america really it's a, i'm getting there and my name's getting out there and i'm getting a lot of good gigs and stuff and it's going really well but no huge star over there is russell brand i'm doing gigs for 30 dollars and looking up and seeing <laughs> him on billboards all over the place for that movie for getting sarah marshall so he's the big star and i hate him for it but <laughs> but no um I spend a lot of time here because I've got a fan base here. You know, over here I do theatres, I do my one-woman show, I can sell out good rooms and I can do the comedy clubs. And in America, I've not reached that level yet because uh, to headline in America, you have to be a draw and you have to be a big star. Whereas to headline a comedy club here, you just have to be funny because people go to comedy regardless. But in America, the comedy clubs are very celebrity-driven. It's like, oh, so-and-so off of Seinfeld is on, let's all go. And that's how it works over there. So I'm trying to build up my reputation over there so I can draw people in but I do a lot of back and forth I'm you know I live in LA at the moment but I'm back in England every couple of months is that a lifestyle thing or is that because you actually do want to break America oh I'd love to break America I think uh, for black comedians here there is a very low glass ceiling and I think I've hit that ceiling <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know I do wear one woman shows and I do very well but you know me and Alan Carr, I started that before Alan Carr, and he was opening up shows that I was headlining when he first came out. You know, but he's got that forum to be able to go, boof, get a TV show, and now he's a huge star selling DVDs all by the truckload and he's in his own TV shows. Whereas black comedians don't get those same opportunities, I'm afraid to say, Alex. I mean, I get a lot of uh, stick for saying this out loud, but Lenny Henry's been saying it for the longest time. And the fact is, most black comedians are waiting for Lenny to die before we can get a break. And that's how it is. <laughs> I'm not saying that there isn't a glass ceiling in America. There is, but it's a lot higher. Uh, you know, I don't mind hitting that glass ceiling if I'm a multimillionaire when I get there. So I've gone to America... Partly for the lifestyle. I'm in LA. The sun shines all the time. I love it. And also, I'm trying to break America and trying to make the big money, trying to make the white boy money. As for you as a funny lady, were yes. you always hysterical? Was there always something a bit odd about you? Yes. I mean, we all are. There's no comedian that's completely normal. Uh, and I was never completely normal. Uh, my mother said that when I was in the womb, the doctors couldn't find me, that I'd actually wandered off into... And they, and they were all around her just feeling her belly going where is this baby uh, <laughs> so she knew she said she always knew that I was going to be an odd one and yeah I was a bit of a clown at school I was always getting into trouble I was more interested in making the rest of the class like, I mean I was a clever kid which meant and I had a very low attention span so I'd finish all my work <clears throat> and then spend the rest of the lesson just making everybody else laugh and so all my school reports used to say she's very intelligent you know she gets high grades and everything but she's very you know it's distracting to the other kids oh well you'd have ADD today wouldn't you yeah I think I would I think <laughs> I would you know it's all they've got all the trendy titles right now whereas when, when, when I was a kid it was just she's very distracting <laughs> and, and badly behaved and annoying <laughs> 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 but then for you to turn that into a career because most people just have to go and get a proper job well I did have a proper job I used to be an engineer I didn't think that you could make a living making people laugh it just I'm from a Nigerian family who are very academically orientated so that's why I went towards I studied electronics and I got a job as an engineer and I was settled in the job and I was like, right, and I'd worked out my career path. I'm going to do this, get promoted, get it, and then end up as a manager and maybe, you know, and my career path was set out. And then I kind of fell into comedy by accident because I used to do voluntary work for various youth organisations and they were doing a fundraiser and I wrote a little, what I thought was a play. I thought I'd written a play. <laughs> Turned out to be a comedy sketch. <laughs> And it got so many laughs and I became addicted to laughter. And I thought, let me just do... And then people were started coming, going, oh, come and do this competition. Come and do this show. I'll give you a fiver. And then it just grew from there. And I just left my job and I've never worked since. So do you think this thing with America <clears throat> and, and being the biggest and best that you can comes from that background of actually being successful and having a proper job and proving that you're actually a bit better than everybody else and more successful? 
I've just got a big ego. That's what it is, Alex. <laughs> I've just got a big ego. And I want everybody to recognise that I am the best. And what better way to be recognised than go to America and compete? Because a lot of British comedians could not go to America and do well in front of American audiences. It's, it's, it's a different kettle of fish. Especially with the whole surrealism and all that stuff that's very fashionable here. Americans don't get it. You know, so you have to be funny. They want to see the setup. They want to see the joke. They want they want to understand it. So the fact that I can do gigs here and go to America and go anywhere in the world, and as long as they can speak English, they're going to get my humour. I think it's a big achievement, and people don't seem to recognise that, but they will. Funny is funny, and it's one of the things I try and get across on this programme. There's only an old joke if you've heard it before. If you haven't heard it, it's not an old joke. And if you're funny, you're funny. Why do we have to bracket people? You know, Joe Pasquale is old-fashioned. No, he isn't. He's funny, and he still pulls a crowd, as do you, in a different way. Exactly, exactly. And that, that, You know, there's a little bit of comedy snobbery going on at the moment, which I just, I've never been privy to. I've never been into that rubbish. You know, the surrealism, they, they talk about... The, and I'm like, no, I get on and I've been slagged off for just being funny. I remember going to Edinburgh uh, in 2003 and doing my show in Edinburgh. And one of the critics uh, gave me a two star. And part of the reason why it gave me only two stars, she doesn't delve deep enough into the African experience. That was what he wrote. This was a guy in The Guardian. And how long were you in Africa? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm born and raised in London. I'm British. I've been to Nigeria once and I hated it. What are you talking about? She doesn't delve deep enough into, into the African experience. And this is what I call middle class racism. So because I'm a black comedian, mm. I've got to talk about black things. And I'm like, well, not necessarily. Can't I just be funny? You know, you don't go to Ross Noble's show and go, he doesn't delve deep enough into, the, into these humble Newcastle roots. <laughs> Shut up, he's just funny. And then when you go to America, I get emails that they say, I speak too quickly. And I say, well, you listen too slow. Do you have to change anything? Because I know some people go over there trying to be a clever dick and then they get it wrong. And they go, no, we just want you to be you. Yeah, I mean, what I've had to do is slow down my speech uh, and enunciate more. That's all, really, I've had to do. Because uh, when I was in England, I always knew I wanted to go and do stuff in America. And I used to send DVDs and they'd go, we, we didn't understand a word you were saying. <laughs> I was like, I'm speaking English. What do you mean? I'm English. I'm speaking English. How could you not understand? But yeah, they literally, I mean, if I, I could be standing next to an American. I remember me and my friend used to do this all the time. We'd go to places like Vegas or whatever. And if we wanted to talk to each other and not have anybody understand what we're saying, we'd just go really cockney and speed it right up. And I, I, and I used to have Americans go, what, what language is that you're speaking? I'm serious. They didn't understand it. They thought we were speaking another language. So when I, when I go over there and do shows, I do literally have to slow down my speech and enunciate. So I've got, I'm a lot posher in America than I am here. I'm very posh. Oh, this is a whole new high class gene. Though, it's really it? weird. I'm going, I'm on stage going, hello, I'm from London. Yes. <laughs> it's really weird. I mean, I, it's a very imperceptible difference, but it's there. But I am definitely much better spoken in America simply because I have to slow down and enunciate. <laughs> is there any dream gig you'd like to do um, in America? For example, to me, Vegas is it. I just think it's incredible. Oh, I'd love to do Vegas. I'd love to do Vegas. And my, one of my dreams is to do Carnegie Hall, which I did last week, believe it or not. Uh, there's a comedian called Cat Williams. Have you heard of him? No. He's a black comedian in America. He's huge. I mean, his concerts are up there in the Billboard charts with Bon Jovi and U2. He's huge. Um, he's concert. He does bigger concerts than Chris Rock. Massive, minimum five thousand seater venues. And but he's a, he's a bit of a. He used to be a pimp in his former life, basically, and uh, he carries a gun illegally. So. Um, <laughs> He was. He had a show as part of the New York Comedy Festival, Carnegie Hall, sold out, sold out Carnegie Hall. He got arrested. He was supposed to be on Conan O'Brien that day and then Carnegie Hall afterwards. He got arrested. So he missed the Conan O'Brien show. And uh, basically, my friend who I was staying with in New York, because I was out there doing shows, got a call in the morning to open for Cat Williams. So he goes, yep, I'll go and open. And I thought, well, I'll come and hang out with you and watch the show, because I quite like Cat Williams. And I wandered in and they were like, we need another comedian to open up. Will's already on stage. Cat's not ready. Can you do 20 minutes? And I'm like, cool. And I went up and I did 20 minutes at a sold out Carnegie Hall. Brilliant. 
Isn't that amazing in this business how you can slog away and you can work hard for 20 years and craft and study and do all of that and it's just you just happen to be in the right there. place at the right time. Isn't that crazy? And then Cat Williams saw me, loved my stuff and sent a limo the next day to take me to Atlantic City to open for him there. Another 6,000 seat no. venue open there and then I'm going to be opening for him in Vegas another 4,000 seater venue sold out you're not doing the Celine Dion room are you uh, I think we are are you really the I Coliseum think, yes we are <laughs> We are. That's the very room. And are there those people who come up to you at the end of the gig <clears> saying, <throat> have you ever done this before? You're very good to say you've never done comedy. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Americans, I've got no idea. I did um, Deaf Comedy Jam. Nobody knows who I am. And they're thinking, who is this guy? All the big black comedians, their careers have been launched from this show. So it's a big thing for black comedians to get on this show. And I'm the first British comedian ever in all its history, to appear on the show. And obviously, I've come from nowhere. I just came into America with no fanfare, under the radar, just doing gigs, got seen, they booked me for the show. So on my, the day that I was shooting, every comedian who happened to be in Los Angeles turned up to watch my set because they were like, who the hell is this girl from England who we've never heard of, who dresses funny and has got this weird accent coming in and doing our show? So they all came to see whether I'd live or die. And obviously I lived, I had a great set. But yeah, you know, nobody, it's literally nobody knows who I am. Let's do some business because we need to make you some money. Is there oh, a yes. DVD I can plug or something? I've got a DVD out. Really? Now, where first. did you get this idea from? Well, the DVD is called <laughs> Skinny B. I'd say Skinny B because I don't think I'm allowed to say the word. But Skinny B. And basically, I used to be fat, Alex. Well, obviously, you saw me on Alan Carr's show all those yes. years ago. You were, no, no, you weren't fat. You were gorgeous. There was no of, There was a lot of you to grow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very nice way of putting it. And I love you for it. But I was fat. And when I first came into comedy, Alex, I was actually very skinny. When I first started doing comedy, I was skinny. And all the late nights, well, obviously the first few years of doing comedy, you're very nervous before a show. You can't eat all day. And then after you do your show, you're like, way! And then you eat and drink and do all that bad stuff. And I just got fat over the course of my comedy career. And I, I thought, and also, you know, I'm in showbiz and you can't say that looks do not sometimes affect your career <laughs> trying to put it nicely yeah that's why i'm sat here hello <laughs> <laughs> you're not he's not that bad thanks for pointing that, that out i really appreciate he's it he's not that bad but the fact <laughs> is i was chubby and i thought well that probably hasn't helped with the tv career and so i what i did i watched a tv show i don't know if you ever saw this tv show with richard blackwood kim wilde and one of the guys from boyzone went to thailand and did celebrity detox <laughs> Well, they stuffed tubes up their buttocks <laughs> and uh, did colonic irrigations every day. And I saw that. And most people were seeing that and were disgusted by it. I saw that and I thought, I'll have some of that. <laughs> and I went, I found the place. I found the place on the internet. Went to Thailand and did a week of colonic irrigations and fasting. <laughs> and I lost a stone in a week. And after that, I kind of moderated my in. And over the last, the following year, I lost about five stone. So I'm now down to a size 10. I'm looking pretty good. And uh, so that was the title of my DVD. It's basically the best of Genie Ashe. It's my best stand-up. I think it's a beautiful DVD. It's a, I think it's a fantastic piece of work. I love it. And it's in the shops. That'll be £40,000 for that advert. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the programme. It's lo lovely to see you because you are hysterical and you'll see that on the DVD. But better still, go and see Genie Ashe live because yes. you're unique and you're brilliant. And thank you for talking to me. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.